So welcome, <coughs> welcome everybody to the uh, research seminar of the Migration Institute. And uh, today our topic is, uh, oh, we have a guest from uh, Denmark, Peter Herbig. And uh, Peter Herbig is giving a talk about the study of strategic ignorance, anthropological perspectives on racializations racialization in Denmark. And I suppose we have all, many of us have uh, followed this situation in, in Denmark or read news and uh, saw some programs, so we've been there looking forward. And uh, let me say about a few words about our, our guest. So Peter Herwig is an anthropologist, and also he has a docentship in the field of international migration and ethnic relations. He is a member of the uh, network of independent scholars of education, Copenhagen, a senior researcher at the Free University in Copenhagen, and former professor in migration studies. Uh, amongst his many publications, let me mention, I noticed that you also have it in your mm -hmm. presentation, Sodan Edebare, Anthropologiske perspektiv på upplevelser och reaktioner på racialisering i Danmark from this year. So how, how uh, people react in the racialization in Denmark saying that's how it is. Also uh, racism, racialization and anti-racism in the Nordic countries edited by Peter in 2018, the book representing a comprehensive effort to understand discrimination, racialization, racism, Islamophobia, anti-racist activism, and the inclusion and exclusion of minorities in Nordic countries. And one more, 2017, together with Method of Nielsen, the book can behavior be controlled women in post-revolutionary Egypt. This book addressing how identity structures and agency affect women's <coughs> everyday lives, lives in post-revolutionary Egypt. And uh, the authors analyzed the topic both of macro level, macro as well as on micro level. So we are glad that you are with us and please come, the floor is yours. And we have plenty of time then to debate, but first we hear the presentation. Short remark, we have about 20, okay, the board of 20 people starting on online, so we have a mixed audience for paper information. So yes. Also, there's about 20 people online listening. Yes, I got it. Hmm. Maybe you have to uh, can, can you click on image? Image. Yeah. Maybe it's deep. Yeah, but then it's, yeah, then it's just deep. Then double click. Yeah. Then we have to start the slideshows. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Can you ever check why this doesn't move the shift, slides? Shift. Yeah, it does. It does here. Yeah. So okay. this. That didn't work. Please, yeah. <coughs> so thank you very much for the kind introduction. I would just add that you could also call me a guest from UNESCO because. Uh, four hours away by train, uh, that's where I am in this fall. And I say I'm really happy for the physical arrangement here today that you come. It's, it, it's just incredible how much more inspiring it is. And I should also say welcome to all those people who are following the live stream on Zoom. And I've just 
glanced over the list and I see a couple of very familiar faces and very warming faces. So that is uh, just great, wonderful. Um, I um, am drawing from two books here. And if I had time, I would talk a little bit about my background because I have a, a very low class background and it's not, you cannot take for granted that I'm here today. And now it goes a little bit crazy because the Danish language book is the first one of its kind ever in Denmark that takes this from a research perspective serious and sort of more holistic. And that book was published five days ago. And when I say this about my background, so I'm a humble person and I was surprised because the other book was supposed to come out 14th of December. It came out six days ago. How about that? <laughs> and that's not how I do things. <laughs> but this is what I draw a lot from today. Um, but before we ever start on on this endeavor here, we have to you have to look at these frequent simplifications that you get in the media, in politics, on social media, in everyday talks and so on. And it's really important, not least the moral, good, bad, civil, uncivil, not least the social, the, the social, care for, don't care for, like, dislike but also the friend and foe and so on. It, it all speaks into this opinion before knowledge. I don't know anything about that, but I'm against it. It sort of moves towards the times we are looking at. Um, and if, if, when you do, when you work with an area like racism or nationalism or Islamophobia as a type of racism and so on, you're moving into all the, you know, the bad stuff. And it is filled with all kinds of frequent simplifications. And if there's something we need, it's less of those when we do the research. If you take the times we are living in, there is this idea, anything goes. You should be able to say whatever you want about whomever you want to talk about in whatever way you want. That is like, it is there. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, a sign of the times we live in. But what does that mean? That means that anything goes and nothing goes. So you cannot take anything important. And if you want to capture that just in a single sentence, we have the that the ultimate boss of the largest commercial advertising company you can think of on the planet Earth, who says, a squirrel dying in front of your house may be more relevant to your interest right now than people dying in Africa. Mark Zuckerberg. Now, he's not a human rights person. This is a boss of the largest commercial advertising company who most people think is their, you know, information, knowledge, and so on, because as Natalie Fenton, a media scholar says, it's not about conveying facts, it's about conveying identity. And that can be used for advertisement. So we already are moving into this area where, well, later I'm going to call it strategic ignorance. One expression of this anything goes is if you remember the Mohammed Khatoun stories, the Danish Mohammed Khatoun affair, 2005 and six, which we looked a lot at and I looked a lot at. And it was only when I spoke to a racism researcher, Philomena Essay about this, she brought up the concept, she worked with, with everyday racism, but she brought up this concept, entitlement racism. She didn't have much empirical stuff to support it, but I had. So I combined those and I saw the reason, the, the reason I could see as a scholar who followed this cartoon uh, issue 
for publishing. The motivation was, you know, they were entitled to, they felt entitled to these men running the, the Danish daily, Jürgen's Boston. They even felt obliged to the freedom to offend and humiliate others as part of this anything goes, as part of entitlement racism. So this all speaks to what has been called, we are in an era of ignorance. You can also say era of other things as well, but the era of ignorance is huge. One of these contributors to that is now we have such a multitude of different outlets for all kinds of scholarly goods, but dare I say in the other end, crap. You can go and search on the internet, you can get anything you want, right? Anything goes, so you can get anything you want. But what happens if anything goes and nothing is important? In the end, that produces some, you know, desperation, anxiety, things like that, that make people reach out easier for something they can hold on to. That can be nationalism, it can be human rights, it can be gender equality, it can be all kinds of things. And then once that is happening, that beats out facts every time. Okay, that's where we're going. But then again, turn to anthropology. And what we do or did as anthropologists, we would do field work in faraway places for a year and so on, at least. And that is sort of this kind of ideal material that informs the entire discipline and then it's being used now uh, everywhere. But if you, like I did, spent a year in a small town in Yucatan in Mexico, you get a lot of experiences. And I brought three children with me, very small ones, and I really had so many encounters, such an enormous material. I tell you, variation, complexity, and so on, was a huge part of it. I have to select. I have to select something out and leave something else out. There is a difference between trivial and significant. And all students who are, you know, on Zoom or in the room, and all their teachers, supervisors know this. You don't want somebody who is examining some event and saying there are 15 courses that created this event. Now I'm done. No, there's some courses you have to do that that are more significant than others. You have to talk about it, discuss it. You might not know it, but you can examine it and argue it and so on. So there is something that is more significant than other things. Anyway, a step back, <clears throat> what we do in Denmark on the racialization, it's extremely important and it's a general point that when you're doing the research or for that matter, when you are sort of a activist only without the scholarship, and usually we are both, um, when you do that, you have to separate what you're up against, whether it's something nitty gritty, idiosyncratic for a specific situation, or you're fighting something much, much larger. So in the Danish book, I try to say, what are sort of five forces throughout history that is uh, in play, creating inequality between nations, different bodies and different human beings. When I use the word forces, I draw on Han Hannah Arendt when she says forces are those whom you cannot really influence, or at least not very directly. And it's important when you run into those in your research and so on, what are you up against? The first one could be liberalism. Uh, then there is nationalism and there's racism. And then there's perhaps a surprise one at the bottom, which we shall get to uh, later. Uh, 
Okay, here's a, just a quick slide that I can just touch upon. So when we are doing research, and that is interviews, media studies, just following debates, monitoring debates, and so on, we come to a pattern which I am positive that you can, you can recognize from your own analysis. analysis. And that is uh, what Deborah Tanner, is on the bottom called agonism, ritual opposition, and so on. That is uh, not about effort to convey facts or dialogue. It's about finding weaknesses and flaws in other others' work. It's about winning the argument, and it happens in this automatic warlike stance. They don't care about facts in a way. It's beyond discussion of facts. <clears throat> we found some of this or a different way to look at it in the conclusions of the Mohammed Khatoun project. And there are books about this. But this is, I think, an extremely important quote. The public sphere is not for dialogue, but an area for serious battling and confrontation. So an advice would be, don't talk content here if you enter the debate. You take that elsewhere. Or probably you stay out of and let people yell and scream on their own, but maybe not. Uh, it's a field where the enemy know before you go into the debate and attack. And this goes back to Carl Schmitt, you know, the crown ideologue in the Nazi period that wrote the book, The Political, saying that, you know, you have to take the political serious, being ready to die for what you stand for, because only then comes democracy fully out, okay? But that also means that they will have no limit to how far your uncompromising stance can go and how extreme language can become and so on, okay? And mind me, Carl Schmitt and Neil Strauss are the founding fathers of neoconservatism. That was particularly strong during uh, George Bush, Anders von Rasmussen in Denmark, and a bunch of others that is sort of behind the Iraq invasion and so on and so forth. You actually got some of the answers of the driving forces behind much of the global populism here. And why one populism expert said, populists, they always win because they dare go further than you. Now, I'm not going to peel onions today, you know, and not having a core at the end, but there is a core coming yeah. later. Yeah. <clears throat> we are moving towards strategic ignorance. And it, I'll do it very short in a way. Um, we were looking because we, we were finding things in the material, and all of a sudden there were a couple of master students that came up with this new book that I hadn't seen. Well, I knew it wasn't, it was from 2008 by Robert Proctor, where he talks about acknowledge, uh, the study of ignorance. And there were different kinds. And the one that is strategic ignorance was particularly relevant for us. But here is the short version of what, how we use it, where certain people don't want you to know certain things or will actively work to organize doubt and uncertainty by any means available. So when somebody says like Jane Elliot, Elliot who is the one lady teacher behind the brown eyed, blue eyed experiments back to the late sixties and were very successful. But she even recently said, you know, racism is just about ignorance. She's not wrong. I actually used some of it in class, not directly, but indirectly by watching some of the experiments. She's not wrong, but the problem is if people are indifferent to their own ignorance, they don't care. 
What about if people don't care about your research results? What are you going to do? This is, you know, part of the strategic ignorance is part of the era of ignorance. Conditions we have to work within. The forces that, the larger forces that produces this includes the professionalization of political communication. All this media training and so on. All the analysis behind this. For instance, when you get the, you, a question comes to you, say, I can't answer that question, but I can say, and then comes the usual stuff. Or the journalist, the, no, no, forget about it. Uh, that is one, one uh, force contributing to the crisis of knowledge, so to speak. Another thing is advertisement industry, and that combines with the attention economy industry, where you, you know, you play games, you go on the internet to look for interesting things, so you don't appear boring, so you have something to post, whatever, whatever, but it takes your attention away from something that might be more important, can't be in two places. And then, of course, there is the structure of the news that is becoming opinion journalism. For instance, you just take two opposing opinions, better one is the drastic one, the dramatic one, and just let them fight out and no, don't give any context. They produce ignorance and strategic ignorance. As we approach now racism, I want to say something general. <clears throat> and you have to think that, that, that what I'm doing in Denmark, I, I cannot lock into a single historical form of racism. I have to look broader to several coexisting forms of suppression. And I also need to look into sort of non-European countries and sort of have a more holistic approach to it. And when you do that, I find much help in deeper uh, Kuma, Islamophobia and the politics of empire is what she wrote. And she said, she makes sure that racism is not a unique, no, not a, a, a trans historical continuity thing uniform and so on that exists as the same thing across time. Well, it is, might be there, but once, you know, you, you get sort of the larger pressure that it's lifted up to become an ideology. That's what he says, racism is a means to an end, political or economic or whatever. Race are produced particular, at particular historical moments to serve particular ends. <clears throat> I can give you many examples, but I think uh, I will try to make it to the end before 45 minutes. So this takes me to a central component of racism. Best illustrated with the image of the scavenger. And you know what a scavenger is. Let's take it like a scavenger for food. Now a person that goes looking for the trash cans for something eatable. The starting point is something to eat. And it's taking things in, maybe something that can be eaten right away or gathered to be cooked later for nice nourishing meals. And it's going, to search for certain trash cans near restaurants might be more helpful and so on. It's the scavenging, whatever can be used within this larger amount of trash, you know. That's a very good image of the scavenger ideology as a central component of racism. It gains its power from its ability to pick out and utilize ideas and values from all kinds of context. Just pick them out of context. If they can be used 
for the racism, for contesting certain others, for constructing certain others, anything can be used. And we see that in Denmark with the ever stricter policies that is hidden under foreigner policy. The heading is nationalism, but you can't say nationalism in Denmark. You can say it in Finland. There's a slight difference in the tone. I know that I, I really did interviews with these people and co colleagues and others in, in, in Finland where, where like the Finns party dare use the word nationalist, but not the Danish People's Party or the three parties now to the right of that party. They don't want to use it. It sounds bad in communication and research. That's what it is. Once you have nationalism, you cannot not have racism. So what they do in this ever stricting, you know, then you hear somebody saying, we don't want the sound of Arabic talk in the pay on the payment. We don't want it in the public. And then there is something about swimming. Then there's something about, you know, food in the kindergarten cannot be halal food or anything else. It just goes on forever and ever. And it takes, well, I, was, I, was, I could go on for that, but, but you got the scavenger. So you've got a basic idea and then reaching out and applying it all kinds of places. Hold on to that. We knew that, we saw that in the research. We saw this constant coming up with new places in the media from these political parties. They were morally upset of this and that and so on, always involving bodies of color, Muslims, for instance, and then attacking. We didn't know what to do with it until all of a sudden, I began to find out that there are other faculties, there are other disciplines and the social science and humanities. I looked in, you know, physics, medicine, astrophysics, neuroscience, and then I got into public schools, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade, and so on. They were talking about fractals. I said, what on earth are fractals? I didn't know, and I didn't have anything in social science and humanities, only something in anthropology about 25, 30 years ago, and it all started with these beautiful patterns and so on, which led me back to the arts where it was all over the place. So I started looking at it and I thought, yeah, that's what the scavenger is doing. It's a fractal extension of the same basic idea to new places. It looks like it's new places, but it's the same damn fractal. It's actually quite simple. It was staring me at the face. So what is it? Well, to explain it, you know, imagine first the famous snowflake. So imagine you've got, you know, this beautiful morning on your window, there's snow all over there. And as you look at it, you can see it has a certain shape as a whole. You go closer and it's the same shape and you get even closer and closer and closer. It's the same basic shape with tiny little differences that repeats itself endlessly, right? Same thing with clouds. You can move on. Foods, for instance, cauliflower, broccoli, and so on. Plants, fern, uh, psychology, trauma, human body, lungs, blood, vessels, you go on. And then it became interesting, and it would be microtubules instead of multitubules. The brains, neuroscientists, astrophysicists, Nobel Prize winners. I actually stopped listening to it, and I was in a webinar with, with uh, some of them. They were quite convincing. They talk about fractals all the time. It's fractals out in space, black holes, and so on and so forth. Uh, then they talk about the brain, the neurons, and the neurons we've talked about for many years, but now it's microtubules, these tiny, tiny little bit of pieces that is actually where consciousness, they say, takes place. 
that it sort of extends itself. So I got to the point and say, okay, um, uh, there were other things involved, but the, the short version is, what if human reasoning, the cognitive part then expressed in language, what if that function as a fractal? So now I could go into the interviews, the commentaries for the social media and so on, and see maybe that explains it. And I thought that was quite convincing. But before I got there, you know, I then ran into Benoit Mandelbrot, who was sort of the father for coming up with actually a very simple formula. And I'll spare you from how it works. I actually explained it in a, in a Danish book, and that is quite incredible that I could explain it, I think. <laughs> it's simple, uh, but it only works with the computer, really, because you, you, it, there's something like you take one computation and the result, you put it back into the next computation and let the computer do that millions of times. You plot it into a graph, you put on some colors, and you get the Mandelbrot set. It's quite incredible. And it was so surprising for, for these mathematicians and physicists um, to come up with this. And then even more so when you begin to zoom in on almost anything here. You can zoom in here on the most interesting graph is this little piece right here. And I don't know how that works on this. <laughs> no, it's probably too much. It's probably too much. <clears throat> so that little black spot to the very left on this slide, imagine you zoom in on it. What do you get? You get the same structure. And that you zoom in and you discover that that same structure, same structure has another little baby thing on the left. You zoom in on that and it's almost identical. And then you put that into a video and imagine the video could actually go on forever. Okay, so as you zoom in, it's practically the same shape you get. Now to further illustrate it, how it works, I found this old article by Jack Lull, a media scholar, who is writing about, you know, there are these uh, thousands of news history, news stories. And there was this teacher of his that said they can all be reduced to just seven master myths or archetypes. So I think the material was something like 4,000 stories and they looked at it and they all lived up to the existence of one or more of these master myths or archetypes. So the big story ends up being the same basic story, but you can also go from the seven myths here and extend and combine them endlessly. This is actually one of the contributions to me, I could say, and I do that in the Danish book, 90% of what the media is writing, we can do without, and we would probably be better off without it. It's the same story, I'm told over and over. <clears throat> I hope the fractals are beginning to make sense for you. <laughs> and you have to be careful because once you start with the fractal thinking, you see it all over the place and it's staring you in the face. <clears throat> Here are some of the concepts we have been using uh, from the literature of fractals and erasure. Once you have a fractal, you are editing something out. And one way of illustrating it is again from the news media. You probably most of you talk to journalists and they have a story. And once they, when they start 
when they contact you, they have an angle to their story, right? And they are very good at staying with that angle. But once you stay with that angle, you can say all kinds of things that does not match the angle. It won't come into the story, usually. So fractal and erasure goes together. We're back in the business of strategic ignorance. Then there is the fractal borders, boundaries, and gray zones, which I won't go into, but that is basically um, basically that you know you cannot have these mutually exclusive categories of things. There are always gray zones in between. It's now being applied to the public-private division and many, many other places. The, the visual image comes actually from Mandelbrot that wrote an article on the British coastline. It looks from afar as a single straight line. But once you get closer to it, you've got the land and you've got the water, and that's not a straight line. Water runs over land. And there is land under the water. There's no straight line there. It's a gray zone. And then there are the fractal scalarity and spatiality that we use a lot here for extension of scales and spaces. Um, you have examples of scales, but spaces where, where it's sort of you have a basic fractal and then you discover it in all kinds of new spaces. So there's no direct link, but they still appear in different places. So this is getting us towards the core. It's not an onion, it's more of a, an avocado. There is a core here. And I should have taken that first. So this is now how neo-nationalism in Denmark work in my argument. It's not just what it is and so on, it's how it works. It works like a fractal, among other things. So we got a specific fractal and there are other fractals. So we call it with our term, nation in danger, that operates at different level. So for a moment, just think of Finland in danger and then play the role if like a theater player, take that in there, and that is the departure for everything you're thinking. And then you imagine how much creativity you can get. You can apply it in all kinds of directions. That's the point. Because after 25 years of nationalism in Denmark, it is so ingrained with people that they don't even know it. It becomes a motivating thing. It's one of the first things many, many people are prompt to say, to react uh, when there is some new specific event in front of them. Oops, better go back there. Yeah. So the physical border here separates those whom we, of course, dislike, hate, and because we dislike and hate them, we find them incompatible and dangerous. It's not an analysis of certain people being incompatible. That's not possible. We're all humans, you know. Of course, humans are compatible. We look at it, right? We dislike and we learn to hate them. And once that is, becoming motivating for us, we go into self-defense measures and at any price will we'll defend the border. But we'll also, and this is the benefit of the fractal spatiality. It's not just that physical border where all bad things come out there from outside and especially Muslims is bad and dangerous and all that. We have to be extra careful about that. Uh, it's so bad that even asylum seekers that desperately need help, leave them out. It's also this fractal spatiality that turns attention inside the border. For all the traitors and cowards who do not stand up and say the same thing as you do, the danger that lies at the physical border. 
He's sometimes called the halal hippies, the weak people, the naive, the blue-eyed tolerant, and so on. The lefties, just go on and on. So that's why you, in the end, you can have the enemy being multiculturalist, Marxist, and you know, Islamist, all in the same. Those we are against. And I think, again, that's the strength of the fractal analysis, that it can take both the internal and the external at the same time. Uh, I want to just let about six slides run here uh, to exemplify. The first one, there it is, at a certain point, there was one swimming, public swimming pool in Copenhagen that said, Saturday morning, you know, there are not so many people here. We have problems getting immigrant women, and that's the term used, to come and learn to swim. There are nobody. And we would like to try to let them come. So for two hours Saturday morning, we have for women only, not just the minority background, but all women. No men are allowed. They can't even look in from the windows and so on. And then all hell breaks, breaks loose. And you can see just, you probably recognize this from other stories here. These are new Danish girls taking over the swimming pool and so on. And the national level goes on. We look at the commentaries at the social media. And you can see this fractal fractal extension from a single public pool on a Saturday morning that becomes the threat of radical Islam of the Middle East. That's a fractal extension. An extension of this nation in danger. The danger is, they say, because you look for arguments that we don't want separation of women and men. Now we do it in all kinds of places, like restrooms and prisons and so on and so forth. But you know, that's different, right? But then again, all of a sudden we got segregated classes in information. There are too many of them. You know, if there are more than 30%, Danes will become intolerant. If you lower the percentage again, the tolerance will return, right? That just shows what a pseudo argument that is. But this case took place. The gymnasium wanted to separate students by ethnicity. Oh, that was ending up being not legal because that is a racial thing. And then they turned to well, using last names, but that was equally bad. They wanted simply to take spread the problem out desegregate in a sense totally apartheid in the heading and it's incredible i think this is incredible or it's in the in the coverage in the early coverage Oops. This pattern has been so prevalent that it's no surprise that we can see it in sort of everyday life everywhere. And I try to, uh, where this opinion comes before knowledge, skepticism becomes before knowledge, and this is some variation you probably find both in your own arguments with your partner or with your colleague here <laughs> or wherever it is. That's just because you are white, brown, black, old, younger, another generation. That's just because you're Italian, you say that. Rich, poor, just go on and on. It's just because. So opinion comes before insight here. 
don't, and it's embedded sort of in the everyday life. Now, even if that is the case, this is also where you've got one of these larger forces that I talked about in the beginning. You don't know who you are until you know whom you hate. And sort of building identity, this can be benign and it can be very strong, but also political power through degrading some other. You don't know who you are until you know whom you hate. Then we are back to Karl Schmitz, the Nazi period, at least. In the Mohammed Khatun coverage, the media, we find it in one third of all articles of some size. We're relying on this. And it comes up years ago, we couldn't answer the question what is Danish identity? What are Danish values? And they talk about Danish food and so on. And a journalist, journalist like uh, you know, she called cooking school in Denmark and say, what is Danish food? There's no such category. But it has to be because that's part of the national nationalism. Nationalism is, you know, you take objective facts, you eat certain food in certain places, you speak a certain language, you have a history, you have a church and so on, and you take it and you lift it up to some brilliant narrative of great us and against somebody else, right? And that is what happened. We couldn't answer the question, but we could say who we are not and do not want to be. So here it can change historically from one place to the other, but uh, Danish national identity is to a large extent being built from being against Muslims and Islam. It's no, it's not a problem, nationalism in itself. I mean, you can like your country, and that's not the issue. It, it's a more or less issue. The problem is that um, is this the illusion that you can be at home and you can be understood only among people like yourself, and that only people like yourself deserve to be in the country, right? This is where it's so clear nationalism and racism goes together. It cannot be separated in this context. And that produces, of course, this us and them. But now hold it for a moment. And now we move into something that I spent at least a chapter on in the Danish language book that is looking at the anti-racist, not least anti-racist persons of color, because there's a section of those who begin to establish their own little company. They are experts, they can come out, but they rely on a very sharp division between us and them. Let's say, uh, who are we fighting against? But who are we fighting for? What are we fighting for? As some of the anti-racist and some of the criticism, criticism that came within the migration area was you know all this stuff about post-colonialism, decoloniality, and so on. Now, the decoloniality, some of the best scholars, well, Ramon Grossfogel, for instance, he ended up summarizing what we are up against. We are up against, hold on, it comes as a slide in a moment, but I learned it by heart and I want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> We are up against the capitalistic, patriarch, patriarchal, Western centric, Christian centric, modern colonial world history. <laughs> Here it is. No, where is uh, There it is. <laughs> it's not wrong, but it's some kind of a monster we're fighting. And what happens if you're fighting monsters and people can't, how you can't, how you So the problem is, as some of the racism scholars like Eduardo Bonilla Silva said, it ends, turns into a demonization of white and a hunt for racists. Or Miri Song says, we end up with a stereotypical view of racism. It's all something white persons do or institutions do. 
they are the perpetrator. But it's a system. Racism is a relationship. And it is all over the place. Brown people, black people, Muslims, and so on, are not exempted from scrutinizing themselves as all the racism scholars that I've been reading, especially Americans, the African American scholars, and Hispanic American scholars, and Arab American scholars, and Asian American scholars, they say the same thing. Because race is not the physical features of specific persons. It's an ideological construction for certain political ends. We're approaching the end. Um, uh, some of these anti-racist, I mean, it's in the beginning, mistakes are making and so on, and that's all fine. I just want them to be more effective because this, this is where we put our hope. I want to support them. But I don't want to reproduce and use racist mechanisms to do so. And that is that is what's tough. So some of them even say, I really, really like Franz Fanon. I am black, this is what I am, I stand by it, and so on. But then did you read Franz Fanon? I like him very much himself. He's a huge figure in anti-racism, post-colonial and, and so on. But what does he say? He says, I am not black. Black is not my first name. Black is not my last name. It's not my inner, it's not my identity. I am a human being. I am a complete human being. Oh, that hurts. That hurts. <clears throat> Very close to the end. So we got binary oppositions and fractal speciality. We got the nationalism, the fractal we call the nation and danger. That has the Oslem division for a broad physical borders mainly. It has the host and guest domestic social boundaries. I'm skipping the host and guest. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I want, I want to put it on quickly. This is a, a collapsed whole nation. You probably know it when people talk about you know one or the other. I mean, that's a fractal extension or even a collapse in them. And in the last, last body of interviews, we find people talked about homes. And what's more natural when you have a home and you have newcomers coming in to talk about hosts and guests. And from the host perspective, the guests do not comply. It is like your home, you have a no smoking rule, you have a guest for dinner, and that guest is smoking like crazy, like a chimney, you know? What happens? You get extremely mad. Well, the host in Denmark here, from the host perspective, expects the guests, the newcomers, to downtone their annoying difference. But they don't. And since they don't, they make me a racist. It's their fault I become racist, which is a classic perpetrator perpetrated reversal. And it's a collapse of home and nation. Now go to the binaries here, and we have a contours of another fractal uh, that we worked on. I am my body, like this understanding, I am brown, I am black, I'm racialized, and so on. That's a fracture. But you know that that ends up using, and this is horrible finding for me, uh, it, it really hurts. The us, them in the national is sub not substituted, it's a fractal spatiality. Now it is white vis-a-vis -vis brown, black, racialized. In the first, in the national one, either you are Danish or you are not. That has no gray zone. But here, it is white versus brown. White are these racist and deniers that, you know, they are fragile and so on. They are ignorant, but they're extremely powerful. And then there are the brown, black, and so on, anti-racist, 
we have embedded in us racism. We know, we have the experience and so on. We, and we are also the ones who decide who is brown and who is white. It's a similar opposition and that hurts because can we really end up arguing that it is a spin-off of the nationalist one? Then there is this replacement of bodies. Just the last thing that I'm here for the end. That's a recent discovery. I was working on a grand replacement theory, which you probably know, the Eurabia, the idea that Muslims are coming in from outside of Europe. They are taking over this the place of Europeans, white Europeans. They are very fertile and so on. That's a conspiracy. It's taking over. But then I look at the anti-racists. When they work on the curriculum at the universities, and I agree with them that that needs to be looked at really carefully. And they look at it and they say, uh, but first of all, the method is confrontation, which is the activism of the time we are living in. That is what the nationalists are doing in politics and so on. Confrontation. It speaks into a war narrative. You know. But then as I read, they say, white bodies should be replaced by brown or, or dark bodies. That's a replacement as a solution for the curriculum. And that hurts because it's a fractal that of the other one, the grand replacement, that says these categories are homogeneous and is all the so different sources of warns of, against against doing this as it speaks of sort of it's a homogenous homo homo group and certainly they don't want people like Nasser Kata in Denmark, Matthias Tasfai or international or Jan Hirsi Ali or Ben Carson in the United States or whoever it's not those brown and black bodies they want in there we also know, need to look at more things but the problem is and it looks like they are a replication or a spin-off of the national nation in danger fracture. <clears throat> so I don't have a conclusion as such, but I was saying if I was going to summarize using the idea of the universe in, in a raindrop. You know the expression, the universe in a raindrop? Just everything is right there, almost like a DNA, okay? So two sentences would summarize it, I thought. There's more to me and you than what you see. Eyes are viewers and projectors. That's the end. Thank you.